Before uh, you go out the cars, we would have a little chat just a bit about Rolls Royce, and that's on the basis really that there, there's still quite a lot of ignorance out there about exactly what Rolls Royce is, what we stand for, a little bit of our history and stuff. I'm not going to keep you for too long, but I thought it might be interesting to you to hear some of that, and certainly I would be grateful if you'd convey some of that to your readers, because we're trying to make sure that people understand just a little bit more about what Rolls Royce stands for. So it's fabulous to be here in Arizona. I mean, it's, it's not England, that's for sure. England is cold and raining at the moment. And that's what we've got here, and it's beautiful. But this is where it really all started for Rolls Royce. This is Charles Rolls and Henry Royce. Charles Rolls was a bit of a swashbuckling hero in his day. He was um, an entrepreneur. He came from a rich family. Um, he was a bit of a hero and an adventurer. He uh, flew balloons before there were airplanes. He flew with the Wright brothers in Paris when they came over with their Wright brothers flyer. He had them sell him the plans of the, of the flyer and he built one for himself. He became the first Brit to fly across the English Channel and back non-stop. And then quite sadly, he became the first Brit to die in an aircraft accident hmm. when he dragged the tail of his Wright brothers flyer in, uh, in Bournemouth at an early, early um, air show. Uh, flipped the thing over and killed himself, sadly. Um, Henry Royce was a little different. Henry was from a poor family, from a poor background, but a very brilliant young man. Became an engineer, started, interestingly enough, making um, electric engines in the very, very earliest days of electricity. Uh, but uh, when he came across the internal combustion engine, he reckoned that this is what he wanted to do. And he started delving into the inner workings of internal combustion engines and eventually made the best engines in the world and turned that into the best drivetrain in the world, which was, of course, then fitted to the dream car that Charles Rolls had come up with and turned into Rolls-Royce, the very best cars in the world, right at the very early days of motoring. Very wonderful um, collaboration between the two, sadly ended by Charles's death, and Sir Henry died in the late 30s in a little house very close to where our current factory is. You can drive down to it and see it, and uh, there's a little plaque outside the house commemorating his death. Um, the BMW Group acquired Rolls-Royce in 1998, um, and just acquired a contract that said we could build motor cars, and we could put the famous two R's on those cars. We had no factory, we had no employees, we had no design, we had no engineering, we had no dealers. All we had was a piece of paper that says, you can make a car and put the two R's on it. For five years, the planning went ahead, a factory was sited and built, a car was designed and brought to the market, and that was the original beautiful Phantom, um, which we brought to market on the 1st of January 2003, and really re-established the Rolls-Royce brand, which had been going through some quite difficult times in the late 80s and early 90s with, with really very poor cars being built. Um, the late Serifs and the late, uh, so the, late, the late Shadows, some of them not very spectacular motor cars at all, which we're not very proud of. But the new Rolls-Royce, we started at the top, we brought out the Phantom, and then in 2006 we stretched it, as you guys would say here in America, <coughs> we made the extended wheelbase. Uh, truly an enormous car, but certainly as an interior space, just the most spectacular, wonderful, luxurious automotive interior space in the world. Kings, queens, prime ministers, movie stars, important people, they love to buy this car and be conveyed in it. Then my personal favorite and what I really think is the best car in the world, the Phantom Drophead Coupe, which we introduced in 2007 what you guys would call a convertible, magnificent, wonderful car. No better way than to drive through the Côte d'Azur of France or up and down the west coast of the United States than in this spectacular car with its, with its uh, teak decking hair over the tonneau cover. It's exactly the same competence as the decks of yachts. And in fact, we had to go out and, and, and steal people from the yacht um, building industry in Portsmouth to come and make this stuff for us, and they now work for us and make this magnificent teak de decking. And then we rounded off the Phantom series in 2008 with the Coupe, and that was uh, the Phantom series well done. 
Then we took the big step in 2009 of introducing Ghost. And Ghost was really a huge move for us. A slightly smaller, slightly less expensive, slightly more approachable Rolls Royce. A really spectacular uh, business tool. I mean, the, just, the, just the best office in the world if you're an entrepreneur, very wealthy person moving from meeting to meeting. Um, this quadrupled the size of the business in a very short period of time and has been extremely successful for us. And in uh, 2011, we stretched it and uh, formed the, uh, uh, the Ghost uh, extended wheelbase, uh, primarily to service requests from our customers in Southeast Asia and China, where they're almost 100% chauffeured. And they wanted just a bigger space in the back of their Ghost, and we made that car. Then, last year, we refreshed the Phantom series. All four Phantoms were refreshed, what you guys would call facelifting. We refreshed them. Um, our customers say to us, guys, don't fiddle with the designs of the car too much. We find the design timeless, beautiful, spectacular. Don't go facelifting the car too dramatically. I just paid $500,000 for the car. I don't want you coming with a facelift, you know. Leave it alone. It's beautiful. I love it. Titivate it slightly, bring the technology up to date, certainly, but don't mess with a timeless design. And so we didn't. We made some very small changes to the exterior of the car, uh, renewed all the electronics and uh, the gearbox and some of the suspension and all the rest of it, and uh, brought the car right up to date. If you think about that in terms of life, life cycles of cars today, I mean, a life cycle of a car is about seven years now, with a refresh somewhere in between. Some, some manufacturers are even going to six years. Three years facelift, three years junk it. Here comes a new one. This car was refreshed after 10 years in the market, and it will now continue in this guise probably for another seven or eight years. You're talking about an 18 year life cycle, which is just unlike anything else in the world. And come what may, come uh, disasters and, and, and uh, economic downturns and uh, all the rest of it, we sell about a thousand phantoms a year. Um, there's always money at the very top end, 800, 900, 1,000 phantoms, come what may in the world. It's a very resilient, wonderful market.